All right, our first talk is um, Dr. Swan is talking about evidence-based management of meniscal tears. Dr. Swan is a sports medicine um, trained uh, physician who works out of our wall office. He's a uh, team physician for Woodbridge, Perth Amboy, Perth Amboy, JFK, and Colonial. So uh, evidence-based management of meniscus tears, I chose this topic because it's a very common problem I see in the office, perhaps the most common reason people come to me. Uh, there is a, a, a lot, there are a lot of questions out there about meniscus tears, and I think there is a lot of misinformation, so I'm hoping I can clear some of that up today. <laughs> I don't think this is working. Turn this power turn on to the side. No, that is. Okay, I have no disclosure to report. Quick overview of the anatomy. This is the bird's eye view of the medial plateau with our lateral and medial meniscus and their C-shaped structures, uh, shape, uh, not quite the same. They do have different shapes and different mobility and different function. But I think we all know where they live. And what do they do? Well, they were once thought to be a vestigial muscle remnant of no known purpose, part of the reason they were frequently taken out. But now they are known to be an important structure for knee force distribution as well as a secondary stabilizer of the knee. We do know that the loss of the entire meniscus by a meniscectomy leads to progressive degenerative changes about the knee decades later. And this was first described by Fairbanks way back in the 1940s. So meniscus tears are common. 35% of people over the age of 50 have a meniscus tear. Two thirds of these people are asymptomatic. And in the presence of osteoarthritis, the prevalence increases, and the worse the arthritis, the higher the prevalence. <coughs> It can be traumatic or degenerative, and that makes a difference. There's a lot of different ways to describe a meniscus tear. Okay, so our radial tears coming directly uh, across the mid-body of the meniscus. There are more flat type of tears. There are degenerative tears, complex tears. That's sort of the ones you see in people over the age of 50. And then there are, there are vertical tears or peripheral tears. You can get horizontal pubis tears, and then there's the bucket handle, which we often hear about. That's the one that can cause a knee to lock. Really what matters is, is it a repairable tear or not? And as far as that goes, like many things in orthopedics, it's all about the blood supply. Arnowski, out of HSS in the early 1980s, described this elegant me with this Indian ink uh, study, which shows that the peripheral one-third perhaps one half of the meniscus has a nice blood supply, and the inner one third is not. <clears throat> Depicted here as well, good blood supply, potential for healing, no blood supply, probably not gonna heal no matter what we do for it. <clears throat> this has also been described in terms of zone, so the peripheral zone is the red zone. That's where our blood supply is, that's where the meniscus may heal if you repair it. Compared to the inner zone, which is the white zone, it has no blood supply and probably doesn't have any potential for healing. The part in between is the red-white zone, and depending on the tear pattern and the patient age and many other factors, we may decide to fix some of this in that location. <clears throat> Here you see a tear, I would call this a vertical tear, some people call it a longitudinal tear, that's probably in the red-white zone, and that's a depiction of one that is repaired. So meniscal injury, as I mentioned, they can be traumatic or atraumatic. The traumatic ones tend to happen in younger people. It usually uh, results in an acutely painful and swollen knee compared to the degenerative tears, which happen more likely in middle and old, uh, middle age and older patients. It can be an, uh, a source of chronic knee pain versus acute on chronic, achy knee suddenly becomes much more painful, or knee was okay up until a couple of days ago, now it's acutely painful and swollen. You may have some of the catching, <coughs> kicking, or locking of the knee. I think this is not that common. I think knee pain uh, is really the main symptom that is described. <coughs> and the exam may include pain from range of motion. It may have a swollen knee. 
Typically, there's effective joint line tenderness, and then positive pro provocative maneuvers such as McMurray's and Anthony's, which we can discuss uh, later. So the diagnosis. The history and the physical, like most of the things we see, are the most important components. I would also mention strongly, though, that plain radiographs are a very important part of this workflow. Jumping right to an MRI is not the right call. <clears throat> plain radiographs do change how we're going to treat these, and I'll explain that in a little bit. <clears throat> and then, of course, MRI is typically the best way, other than arthroscopy itself, to diagnose these. Here we see a normal knee radiograph. Very important to get weight-bearing knee films, okay? That's the best way to see if there's any joint collapse like there is here in this arthritic knee. There's no joint space left. There's some bone spurs you can see. A lot of times you don't see that unless you get a weight-bearing view. So it's a waste of resources when a patient shows up with a knee film that's not weight-bearing. I have to repeat their films. And uh, they should just have a weight-bearing film in the first time around. If you don't get that, you may be surprised when you get inside a knee and you scope it and it has terrible arthritis. You didn't see that on your x-ray. It wasn't a weight-bearing view. As far as MRIs go, <coughs> best way to diagnose these in the, in the office setting, this is a sagittal T1-weighted MRI. This is our meniscus in the back here, and the anterior horn here, and this big arrow is pointing to this white line through the meniscus. That's a vertical tear of the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. <coughs> in this view, the green arrow is pointing to where the meniscus should be, but it's not there. There's actually not even a tear right here, so much as it's been engulfed from the capsule. And if you look closely, this anterior horn looks funny. There's probably a flipped component of meniscus in the front of the knee. This knee looks extended, but I bet that patient can't hyperextend because their knee is a little locked. <coughs> a coronal image showing our, our femur, tibia, the lateral meniscus, which has this triangular shaped structure, and, and the central part of it uh, as it thins out, on the medial side, meniscus looks a little funny, a little bit of white signal within it. Uh, you don't see that, uh, that central inner part coming in the middle, but you do see a flipped component of the meniscus. That too may cause a lot of pain. <coughs> so what's the treatment? Well, in the young patient, we have learned that not after treatment is not typically recommended. We try to preserve the meniscus by repairing it, or by debriding the smaller tears to prevent the progression of the tear. The definition of young is uh, a matter of debate, however. What, what age patient should you be repairing these in? Someone 25 years old? Probably 35 years old? Maybe 50 years old? Many people say no, but Frank Noyes out of Cincinnati will repair people up to about 50 years old. Um, that's sort of how they do it out there, and there is some evidence to support that. <coughs> Why do we do that? Well, as I mentioned before, meniscectomy um, results in increase in the contact stress area, resulting in increased stress on the articular cartilage. We know that the increased stress uh, is in proportion to the amount of meniscus that is removed, and this increased stress inevitably leads to degeneration of the joint in many people. This is a, a degenerative meniscus tear here. It's not like a vertical tear that you sort of sew back together. You're not going to be able to do that. So this one does require a debriefing, a meniscectomy. The question is, how much is too much? <clears throat> well, meniscectomy and osteoarthritis, there are some uh, decent papers on this. As I, I mentioned Fairbanks way back in 1948 described a progressive radiographic change seen in patients uh, up to 14 years uh, later um, in patients who had had an open meniscectomy. Interesting, and I guess important, is that he found no correlation with the clinical findings compared to the radiographic findings, meaning some of the patients did have significant arthritic change, but it didn't necessarily mean that they were having a lot of pain. Jorgensen, a little bit more recently, had 14 and a half year follow-up, both clinically and radiographically, in athletes who had open meniscectomy. And they used the uh, contralateral knee for control, and they found a significant number, 89% had radiographic changes 14 and a half years later. Two thirds of those were symptomatic, and a third of them could no longer play their sport because of that knee pain. 
Just a, a, a brief overview. We use a couple of different grading scales to grade arthritis in these papers that I'm describing. We'll use either the Kelvin Lawrence radiographic criteria or Fairbanks criteria. Uh, basically, it's zero to four or zero to three, and the higher the number, the worse the arthritis. Grade four here has terrible bone on bone disease, eating knee replacement, uh, compared to the zeros are normal and the ones are maybe some mild or three changes. So osteoarthritis after meniscus repair or partial meniscectomies, these are done arthroscopically compared to the other two uh, studies I mentioned. This is a level three cohort. <coughs> so they had four and a half and nine year blinded radiographic follow-up. These relatively young patients, these were considered traumatic tears. They were not degenerative. They were vertical tears and bucket handle tears, some of which could be repaired, some of which were in the white zone and were, were not repairable. Or were not prepared. <clears throat> and they found a significant difference in nine years in these two groups. At four and a half years, they did not see these changes, but in nine years, they did see 60% arthritic changes in those who underwent the metasectomy, arthroscopic metasectomy, compared to those who underwent repair, where they had uh, only 20% arthritic changes. These were mild changes that we're talking about. There were changes, and there was a difference. In addition, the repair had a much higher return to sports. The bottom line of all this is save the meniscus when you can. <clears throat> so meniscus tears in young people, it's very well accepted that you need to repair these when possible. <clears throat> Who do you repair them in? Young, healthy patients. We prefer them to be non-smokers. Smoking, I'm sure most of you know, uh, affects most of the things we do in orthopedics. It affects bone healing, tissue healing, wound healing. It makes arthritis worse, and uh, it probably affects meniscus. We prefer to fix them when it's in the red zone, the red white zone. The tear pattern matters. If it's a degenerative, complex tear, you probably can't fix it. There's the acuity matter. It actually may not. The literature is not clear on that. But the older a tear is, the more likely it is to be sort of beaten up and more difficult to repair. If it's in conjunction with any cell reconstruction, there's a better chance of healing, and I'll get into that in a second. And then Morgan, Craig Morgan in 1991, uh, described how the knee is not stable, meaning if they have an ACL tear or an other ligament sensitivity, you can repair that meniscus, but that's going to fail. So that's the wrong thing to do. Fixing a meniscus but not taking care of the ACL is the wrong thing to do. You need that knee to be stable. I mentioned ACL reconstruction. Typically, menisci have an 80%, 82% healing rate, but it's different if it's done with the ACL or without. If it's an isolated repair, it's only about a 50% healing rate compared to if in conjunction with the ACL reconstruction, there's a 90% healing rate. This has been described in several studies, and they have different ways of evaluating the meniscus, not just symptomatically, but uh, an arthroscopy, an arthrogram. The Moon Study Group is doing a lot of prospective work these days, and they've described this as well. The bottom line is we think that the stem cells are released into the joint after an ACL reconstruction, and that may be what allows these meniscus to heal. Now, there's other theories out there as well, but we do know that they do better if it's in conjunction with the ACL uh, reconstruction. But the clin clinical question then, and we know what to do with young people, the clinical question is, what is the optimal treatment of a middle-aged patient with a symptomatic meniscus tear? So I performed a PubMed search with all these relevant terms and mostly considered level one and level two studies. Just to review, in orthopedics, a level of evidence goes one to five, one being well-designed, uh, systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials, good randomized controlled trials, those are level one, all the way up to level five, which is expert opinion, which is not considered very good evidence. We, we, we uh, evaluated mostly level ones and twos. So near arthroscopy, there's a, in 2006, there were about 700,000 arthroscopy is performed for meniscus pathology. And the question arises, should we be doing this? And here's one of the reasons. MRI is a problem in medicine because if you see how it goes, typically it's going to go, patient with knee pain, it's MRI, MRI shows meniscus tear, meniscus tear, meniscus tear, it's an arthroscopy. But that's not very good uh, judgment for thinking. And I go back to this slide where we know 
The meniscus tears are very common, and they're very commonly asymptomatic. So if you get an MRI that shows a meniscus tear, should, be, should you be operating on that patient for that? <clears throat> well, back in 2002, Mosley had this landmark study that sort of shook up the orthopedic world, the orthopedic sports world. I was in the middle of my training with it when this came out. Uh, this was a, you know it's a good study when it gets into New England Journal of Medicine. Orthopedic stuff doesn't normally work there. This was a randomized control trial, level one, and they compared arthroscopy with debridement and meniscectomy versus lavage surgery, where they just stuck the scope in the knee and flushed out the knee, compared to a sham surgery, where they put people to sleep and made incisions in their knees, but they did not do any, any uh, actual surgery. And their conclusion showed that there was no difference among these groups. This was different than what we, what we thought, although when we were scoping arthritic knees, we sort of knew that this can't be the best thing for the patient. They're going to need a new person soon. But that was how we treated them. <clears throat> this study uh, created a lot of controversy, um, and it was criticized by the orthopedic community because there were some <coughs> problems with their design. However, more recently, Kirkley performed a similar study uh, that was more, it was also with level one. So sorry, this was a level one study, but it did have some problems with it. It doesn't make it a perfect study. Kirkley's was a, a, a better study in terms of its design, and it had similar findings. So now we think of things a little differently. Should we scope this patient's knee for their meniscus tear? They came into you with an MRI that showed they have a meniscus tear, which they do. They have this lateral meniscus over here, which has this white signal in it, probably a horizontal cleavage tear. And they have a medial meniscus over here, which is torn as well. But really, it's getting squeezed out of the joint. The joint has collapsed with arthritis. And really, the most important part of this MRI is this bright white signal on both the, the thermal condyle and the tibial plateau. If you go ahead and scope this knee, you're not helping this patient because the real problem is the arthritis. When you look inside that knee, look inside that knee and you may find your meniscus tear, but really what we're looking at here is missing cartilage, bone, exposed bone, same thing on the thermal condyle, exposed bone. You can debris that a little bit, but you're probably not going to help that patient. Or are you? So arthroscopy and osteoarthritis. In general, we now know what should have been obvious, that doing an arthroscopy for a patient with advanced arthritis is no longer appropriate. But what about the, the the knee, doing a knee arthroscopy for someone with a meniscus tear who has mild arthritic changes, or no arthritis? I ask this question because this is what I see all day long. The vast majority of my patients are probably 40, 50, 60 year olds who may have some mild arthritis and may have a meniscus tear, and what are we gonna do for them? Shavonin also put a study in the New England Journal of Medicine, 2013, this is a multi-center study with level two evidence. And they performed partial meniscectomies arthroscopically versus a sham surgery. They too found no difference in people with, with arth without arthritis and meniscus tears. This was a 12 month follow up. But this too was criticized by the community in that there were some definite differences seen in the groups uh, once you sorted out the data. But it led to other studies. And Merlin performed a couple of studies, the most recent one published in 2013, it's a level one study. They performed arthroscopy and compared it to physical therapy alone for patients with no or minimal arthritis. They were middle-aged patients, exactly the ones we're talking about. And their findings showed that the therapy group did as well as the arthroscopy and therapy group. with five-year follow-up, good follow-up. So this garners a lot of headlines, and the New York Times loves to capitalize on this type of stuff. And we're doing unnecessary surgery. Surgery uh, doesn't help, uh, and uh, we shouldn't be doing it. <clears throat> However, when you look at these studies, it's important to see who crosses over. And what that means is which patients fall out of the therapy group and into the surgery group. Patients who aren't doing well with therapy, they're not satisfied, they're doing it for months at a time, and they're not getting any better and they get frustrated and they fall into the surgery group. In this study, it found that a third of the patients crossed over and they improved after their arthroscopy. The New York Times didn't report on that part of the study. 
In addition, this study also found that there's no progression of arthritis in surgical boot. This is that five years follow-up, and that's an important thing to note as well. I'll get back to that in a second. <coughs> that same year, Katz also put a study in New England Journal of Medicine, level one evidence, arthroscopy and therapy versus therapy alone. One year follow-up, exactly what patients were talking about. They too found no difference. They too garnered headlines for this study, but they too had 35% crossover and those who crossed over had improved results. So what didn't get in the headlines was that the treatment failure, if you did therapy alone, you had about 50% chance of failure, compared to if you had, you had an arthroscopy. Significant amount did fail this treatment. They had some arthritis, okay, they have a meniscus tear, not everyone gets better, but it is important to note that there is a subsection of patients who won't do well with therapy and who do need the arthroscopy. They measure this by Womack scores, that's an arthritic, an arthritis a grading scale. What have we learned from all this? Well, arthroscopy versus conservative treatment for meniscus tears. Not all meniscus tears need surgery. That much we know, we've learned that over the years. But that, that does not mean that all meniscus tears do not need surgery. Our job is to figure out who they are. So if we're not gonna operate them, what are they gonna do? Most patients come in with an MRI that says, I have a meniscus tear, I need surgery. That's what they think. And you have to talk them out of surgery. What can we do for them? Well, their meniscus is not going to heal, okay? If they're a middle-aged patient with a degenerative meniscus tear, it's not gonna heal on the MRI, that doesn't mean their symptoms are gonna stick around. So, a lot of medicines we can offer, anti-inflammatories, pain medications, glucosamine chondroitin is something we talk about. People love to talk about their fish oils. There's a lot of things people will take that, that, that may or may not help them. Knee bracing, injections, we can do cortisone injections, we can do visco supplementation, and then definitely therapy seems to be the mainstay of, of helping these patients recover. I mentioned before, does arthroscopy and mastectomy lead to arthritis? Some patients come to me and say they don't want their knees filled because they've heard it causes arthritis. Well, does it? So Paxton did a, a systematic review, not the best level of evidence. But they had 10-year year, uh, follow-up in patients uh, who had arthroscopies. And those who had a mastectomy versus those who had a repair, those who had a mastectomy had a higher rate of arthritis. However, those who had a repair had a much higher reoperation rate, meaning the repair may have failed, and there is a relatively high failure rate. Importantly, this said uh, the study, uh, as I mentioned, wasn't the best evidence, and there were different patient populations in these two groups. So you can't fully say, but it is possible that removing too much meniscus is going to lead to arthritis. We know that. I refer back to this study that I mentioned before. These guys had a level one study which showed at, at least at five years there wasn't progression of arthritis in the surgical group. Let's go back to our clinical, clinical question. What is the optimal treatment of a middle-aged patient with a symptomatic meniscus tear? I think the evidence pretty strongly says that non-operative management is an appropriate first step. And that's, that's sort of the first thing that the orthopedic surgeon has to accept. And I think we have come to do that for the most part. <coughs> now we have to convince the patients that that's okay. Not all of them are agreeing with that, so it takes some hand-holding. But that's the first good step. Therapy is important. You can modify their activities, you can offer medications, sometimes injections are great. Um, and those who fail, though, we know that many will fail, probably a third of them will fail, and those are patients who may be good candidates for arthroscopy or for meniscectomy. And arthroscopy, we do know arthroscopy is unpredictable in those with advanced arthritis. So for sure, if someone walks in with grade four arthritis and an MRI, which they probably shouldn't have even uh, had done, because we know that they have arthritis, but their MRI shows advanced arthritis and a meniscus tear, Scoping that patient would not be the first line of treatment. For some reason, sort of what I just said, uh, many patients will do well without surgery. The literature is not conclusive on whether partial arthroscopic meniscectomy uh, can cause arthritis, and maybe it cause arthritis. Thank you. Take one or two questions if anybody has one. That's fine. Yes. I've heard a lot of doctors talk about repairing the meniscus. So when you go in there and you repair the meniscus, 
is, is, is the meniscus truly repaired or is it just refixated? In other words, in five years, if you go in there and take those sutures out, are you still going to have a damaged meniscus or is it going to be rehealed? I think it's a, it's a good question and some of the repairs are not fully healed. A, a small but significant percentage of them don't heal and they're just being stabilized. When you look at some of the studies that show arthrograms or MRIs, and, and you have to get an MR arthrogram to see a meniscus repair, or the arthroscopy studies, which actually look at it and probe the meniscus, they'll say the, the ones that heal, the majority are fully healed, some are partially healed, and some are not healed but are, are being held together. But they do indeed heal, and the more <coughs> peripheral they are, close to that blood supply, you can expect a very good healing, full healing of in many of them. Another question? Okay, 35% that won't do well with you, just physical therapy. How long do you do PT, physical supplementation before you say, all right, let's just go in there and do the next second? Usually a couple of months. That depends a little bit on the chronicity of their problem and the, the amount of arthritis. So if it's a pristine looking knee and a young, youngish 50 year old, someone who runs is in good shape and they don't seem to have a lot of arthritis in that patient, I'm, I'm not, I may only give them a month, six weeks. Compared to someone who has more arthritic need and is not in bad shape, then they may be able to uh, you can hold them off longer and they may be All right, thank you.